everyone, and welcome to the last session of the MBA Artificial Intelligence class for uh, the Pool College of Management, the Jenkins MBA. Um, I'm going to break this up into a few sessions. The first session is going to be about, the first part is going to be about the theory behind AI and neural nets, or sorry, perceptrons, neural nets, and deep learning. Then I'm going to use the next couple of sessions to talk about an application of Deep learning and a bunch of other of the techniques we've talked about in this class uh, that my students and I have been working on for a um, uh, for to look at Instagram data. Uh, so that's going to be kind of a real application to some extent. It'll kind of be a good way to summarize a lot of what we talked about in the class and end the class, right? So um, let's talk about neural architecture. So where does the idea of neural net comes from? Well, the basic idea behind neural architecture solutions are. Um, to try and take the AI um, system and base it upon the real brain, right? Um, and the human brain is composed of many, many neurons, as you know. And these neurons essentially store information by a configuration of activations and their propensity to activate. And there's a famous rule called Hebb's rule that basically said that if cell A causes cell B to fire in the past, then they will wire so that they may, so it makes it more easier for it to do in the future, right? And this happens through an electrochemical process between the neurons, right? Um, so in other words, you know, a kind of a simple way of saying this sometimes is things that fire together wire together, right? So that, in other words, they become more tuned to each other. And the idea was that that is how we store things like memories and we do computational processing um, and all these kind of aspects over time, right? And so in um, 1958, this idea was put together as a notion of something called a perceptron. And the way a perceptron worked was it was essentially a single neuron and you were training a single neuron to kind of try and classify data. And, and and originally it started as a single neuron, then it became multiple neurons and so forth, right? And essentially these neurons, which the kind of the perceptron layer is depicted here, right? They would take inputs and then the weight of them would then be distributed over a series of outputs. And if the weight times the input plus some bias term was greater than zero, right? Then it would output an answer one, otherwise it would output an answer zero. Um, and the solution would be to kind of, kind of uh, look through um, the weights and assign the weights in the correct way, such that for the same right input you got the right answer. And so, um, for things like um, a simple linear classifier, this worked very well, right? Because you can look at this form as like y equals mx plus b, right? Um, essentially, it learns a line, and by combining multiple perceptions, we can get multiple lines together. Uh, the problem is, the, no matter how many perceptrons you put together, there are slightly more complex functions that you can't classify very well, right? You can't classify, for instance, what's called an XOR function, where I'm going to turn on, I'm going to be turn on yes if one of the inputs is true, uh, but not both of them. Right, and that's called an exclusive OR function. So that was discovered in 1969. It kind of caused the death knell for perceptron and neural net research for a while. But then in the 1970s, a solution uh, using a hidden layer was discovered to solve the XOR problem. Uh, the perceptron essentially failed because it had no way to create nonlinear functionality, right? And by putting in these hidden layers, that were not the input layer or the output layer, you could allow for nonlinear combinations of inputs to occur. Um, but the question then became, how do you train these complex architectures? If you go back to the perceptron, right, it, it's, it's still not super simple, but it becomes fairly easy to figure out how you put the weights on these different inputs to map to the outputs correctly, right? But with all these hidden layers, how do you do that? How do you figure out the correct weights to add on there, right? Um, and in 1974, an algorithm called the backpropagation algorithm solved this problem. Essentially, what it said was that you just keep giving the neural net some examples, and if it gets it right, if the neuron lights up correctly, then you propagate back a reward from that neuron to the neurons that caused it to fire, right? And so you distribute that weight among the neurons that caused it to fire, essentially reenacting that Hebb's rule where neurons that fire together, wire together, right? 
Um, and this is sometimes called the bucket brigade algorithm. So uh, this is based around the old idea that in a bucket brigade, you keep passing water back up to the next person, right? Uh, and so each person who helped you get the water to put out the fire uh, is, is, is part of the person who's getting some reward, I guess, right? Is uh, some of the discussion behind it, right? Um, now, it's kind of a weird analogy because I don't think there's multiple lines competing to put out the fire, but that's another story. Um, so then we get to the next advance, which is really deep learning. The problem with neural nets, right, is they were great and they work very well. Uh, but, you know, as we continue to increase the numbers of layers and inputs, right, they became unmanageable and we need lots and lots of computation, lots and lots of examples to actually get them to work. Um, however, it turns out if we build our architecture correctly, right, in terms of the way we have the multiple layers putting together, we can offload some of that computation, right? We can essentially have the neural net itself kind of selecting what the most important are and then choose the most important impulse and collapse to a smaller number of outputs, right? Um, now, I shouldn't mention before I get too much into the deep learning solutions that are out there, right? that there's gonna there's a lot of hype around the term deep learning, right? And so you might see people say, oh, we need deep learning for this, we need deep learning for that. In truth, there aren't, there are a lot of places where deep learning works really well, but there's a lot of places where deep learning tries to get applied that it doesn't work. And that's why I have this little Marketunist car, cartoon down there. Where should we focus here? Blockchain, it'll change everything. Everybody's talking about it. You can replace that with the word deep learning at the same result, right? Um, and, you know, they keep asking and people finally say, what exactly is blockchain? I say, also artificial intelligence, right? And so that's like the kind of idea, right? Like sometimes people are going to tell you, I want to use a deep learning approach and they have no idea what that means, except for the fact they think it's cool, right? In reality, deep learning works very well for um, uh, certain types of problems. One of them is convolutional neural networks and convolutional neural networks are deep learning architecture that you can apply to images. And so in this case, you're building one basic kind of um, structure for the neural net, but then it's scanning over the image over time in some ways, right? So rather than processing the entire image simultaneously, it's almost as if you're processing in chunks, right? In chunks of, of and that, that layer that processes the chunks is called the convolution error layer. We can then combine those convolution layers back up together to get a, a um, using a pulling layer, right, to get a final result, right? And so then we can use it to label an image. So essentially, what you can think of is that we're kind of like processing this image, like, is this a robot? Is this a robot? Is this a robot? And we get different inputs from that. And then we combine those different inputs to get either yes, hopefully in this case it isn't a robot, or no, it's not, right, through a final set of layers, right? And so as a result, there's a sparsity of the connections in this space, right? Because we're not connecting all the layers to all the layers. We're instead connecting them strategically in a way that we're processing parts of the image separately from each other, right? Uh, and that's essentially the way that we kind of go from these images to this output. And why is image, a good, image recognition a good example of where we might want to use uh, deep learning? First of all, there's lots of labeled training data out there. Second of all, the input is highly uh, high dimensional, right? There's lots of pixels that we can use to take and analyze the data, right? Third, right, there is a, this is a problem that's not easily solved through a lot of other approaches that are out there, right? And so really, it's only in those cases where all three of those criteria are met. You have lots of training data because neural nets and deep learning require lots of training data. Two, you have lots of um, you have a high dimensional input going into the system. And three, really no other approach is really going to help you understand the structure of the system. Mainly, usually that means the data is unstructured. But, you know, anyways, um, that those are the three criteria you really need to meet to apply deep learning in a lot of places. Um, there are other types of deep learning architecture out there besides convolutional neural nets. There's something called recurrent neural nets and long term, short term memory, long short term memory, sorry, which have hidden layers that allow you to loop back to the inputs. And so these will actually allow you to do things like maintain a memory. They're really good for doing things like um, um, reading a, a, a um, uh, reading a, a piece of text, right? And processing that piece of text because they can kind of remember what they saw before and keep processing or processing audio, right? Because audio comes in a linear fashion, unlike an image, which you can kind of look at all at once. 
Another approach that's used a lot in deep learning is word to vector glove. Uh, these are essentially our embeddings, right? So they're taking um, a, a large set of words and then determining the co-similarity between them and all the other words, right? Um, so you know you can you can then use this to determine how similar two other words are that you have, right? So you might determine that dolphin is similar to porpoise, but different from France, which is similar to Austria, right? Um, and you can use these embeddings to then take new new words that you haven't done all this research on and try and figure out how similar they are to other words. This can be useful for things like where you're trying to do language answering, right? So if you're trying to answer a question, right, you can use a word to vec or a globe solution or other kind of word embedding solution to kind of determine um, which words are close to each other. There's a more general class of, of, of embeddings here that aren't just based from words, but around other ones. And things like uh, TS and E are a solution space in there that will allow you to take just arbitrary um, deep learning architectures and use them to embed uh, relationships between things. So for instance, you could determine how similar two images are to each other. Um, another approach that's often used in deep learning is adversarial learning, right? So most of the examples we've talked about, they require you to have a labeled set of outputs, right? But in some places, you might just, you could just create one neural net for good and one for evil is kind of the way to think of it, right? Um, and then just train them against each other. So this is often used to train things like um, games. So Go, right, the famous AlphaGo, which beats uh, the grandmasters, right? One of the ways it was trained was through the use of, of, of adversarial training. It would basically play against itself, and that helped it learn more and more how to best move in that system, right? Finally, I want to mention a really cool idea that's kind of not um, used as much as I would love to see, but I'd love to see it used more often, which is deep cue learning. And deep cue learning is essentially reinforcement learning using deep networks and environments with discrete action choices. And I, I mentioned reinforcement learning very briefly at the beginning of this talk, or at the beginning of this whole class, right? But deep Q learning is the ability to kind of really process what kind of actions or what kind of policies should I take into place to best achieve rewards I want when I don't know when and how exactly I'm getting those rewards, right? So you can imagine that, for instance, a, a car right, being trained to drive down the street. It doesn't get a lot of rewards in terms of like not hitting someone, but over time it can develop policies that it might learn for those kind of things. There's a bunch of tools out there for deep learning. I think I'd be amiss not to mention some of them. Uh, we're gonna talk about how to create some in, in even R in the, in the tutorials I'm gonna go through, but you can use um, a bunch of other tool that's, the tools that are out there. So Google, uh, among others, has uh, worked out and released the, the TensorFlow packages, which is um, a great little set of packages that exist to kind of build up these architectures. There's a tool called Curious, which is popularly used, Torch, PyLearn, which is a Python uh, package, DeepPy. Um, there's also hardware that you can use to kind of um, specifically run these deep learning tools. Um, things like um, NVIDIA box architectures, uh, the Digis dev box, right? And these are tuned just to run deep learning approaches. And then of course, uh, there's a bunch of cloud offerings for deep learning and AWS, Microsoft, and Google all make uh, uh, um, tools available in this space. So that's it for deep learning neural nets and perceptrons. In the next section, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we actually applied one of these in our own work.